Welcome back to Ty and That Guy. I'm Wes Chatham, and this is my good friend Ty Frank. And uh, we're excited to be with you this evening. I know we haven't talked about The Expanse in a while. We've been in spooky month, and uh, Ty and I, we uh, we like the thrills and the scares, and we like those type of movies. So we've been talking a little bit about spooky movies. And pretty soon we'll get back to The Expanse. Please be patient with us. But if you love horror, you came to the right place. If you're looking for trouble, you came to the right place. <laughs> Today we're talking about... <laughs> yeah, Black Phone. I'm very excited. Joe Hill, one of my favorite writers right now. Like I, I buy everything he puts out. Like The day it comes out, I just get it. Um, I'm a huge fan of his. And the writer-director duo that worked on Black Phone, I've really become a big fan of theirs too. So, Did you get me hip to Joe Hill? I did, yeah. Oh, I yeah, yeah. told you to read his stuff. I told you to read 20th Century Ghosts. Right. Which is one of his story collections. Yeah. And once you read that, you were like, you were all in from then on. Yeah. And, you know, we've talked about this ad nauseum on this podcast, but I am a Stephen King fan, like a diehard fan. And I read every, I just, I read everything when his book comes out. As soon as it comes out, I read it. I just read his latest fairy tale. Have you had a chance to look at that one yet? I have not read it yet. Yeah. I just finished, I just finished the other one about the kid who, um, the Sixth Sense kid. Yeah. What is it? Billy? uh, Oh. No, that that's the one about the hitman. Billy Summers is the one. About oh, Billy the Summers about the hitman, and then the, yeah. yeah, and I get those confused because they both yeah. have that dime store novel type. Anyway, yeah. So I just finished Fairy Tale, and when you get a chance, I really uh, want to talk about that one. That one's really interesting. It's next on my list. I really enjoyed it, and it was vintage Stephen King in some ways, but it was completely new in other ways. Like I don't know, I'd, I haven't read him lean into fantasy this way. There is one other book that is straight up. Uh, horror epic fantasy. Um, have you ever read Eyes of the Dragon? No. And Eyes of you the Dragon is one of, Yeah, and that's one of those books that when I'm going through his list and I'm like, read that one, read that one, and I come across that one and it's like, it, I'm always reminded, like when I see Eyes of the Dragon or somebody refer to it, I'm always reminded, wait a minute, that was Stephen King, right? And I was like, yeah. oh, I gotta get around and read that. And It's, a, um, it's really good. I really enjoyed it. And it, it does tie into his like sort of larger Black Tower universe. Mm-hmm. Because there's some characters in Eyes of the Dragon that have some crossover with sort of the Black Tower stories. Mm-hmm. or dark, Not Black Tower, excuse me. The Dark Tower stories. But it is pretty much straight up like a fantasy. It's a fantasy novel, but it just has that Stephen King twist on it. Yeah. You know what? It, it's like this one is like Ray Bradbury, um, Lovecraft, uh, all oh. the fantasies, everything. Like It's like every favorite piece of story that he's ever read. And just balled up and thrown into one story with the Stephen King signature on it. Like these fantastic well, you characters. At, you had me at Bradbury and Lovecraft. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I really- mean, like somebody says, this is a mix of Bradbury and Lovecraft. I'm just buying that book. I right. like it doesn't matter. Everything you say after that doesn't matter. I'm and the, buy the anyway. villains is very Lovecraftian, you know, in the world and how gross and, and, and but he embraces it in the story. Yeah. Um, which I think is really interesting. It's well, all, I was already going to buy it, but I'm extra going to buy it. Yeah, now. I can't. Well, I can't wait to, to read it. We can talk about it. And we still got to talk about Between Two Fires, but that's another thing. The only thing about this is it, the setting was in Illinois. And I'm like, no, King, you go back to Maine, dude. That, I want you in <laughs> Derry, Maine. <laughs> that's what I want. I mean, the reason you bring up the Stephen King connection, of course, it turned out after Joe Hill had been publishing for a while and making his own name, one of his books came out that the publisher put an author photo on the back of. And immediately the gig was up because everybody saw that author photo and that guy looks exactly like Stephen King. And so uh, so Joe had been trying to hide the fact that he was Stephen King's son when he started his publishing career and actually had an agreement with his publisher that they would not reveal that. He really wanted to know if he could make it on his own. He really wanted to know if he could make a writing career that did not draft off his father's writing career. And if I didn't already respect his work so much, I, like I would m- massively add more respect for the fact that he was like, yes, I know it's a huge leg up in the writing world if you, you're Stephen King's son, but I'm not going to use that. I'm going to just write and hope my writing is good enough to make it on its own. And uh, he did. He did exactly that. He wrote a bunch of short stories that got a lot of attention. My first story that I read of Joe Hills is there's a collection by John Joseph Adams called um, The Living Dead, but it's a zombie collection. I think it came out in the early 2000s, but Joe Hill has a story in it. He has, he has one story in it. And it's the only story in that collection in which no zombies actually show up. Mm. It's a story about a guy who is an extra 
on the set of Dawn of the Dead being directed by George Romero. And he's just an extra. So he's in zombie makeup and he runs into a woman that he knew when they were both younger that he was in love with back then. But now she's she's older. She's married. She's got a kid. And just it's sort of like meeting up with her brings back a bunch of memories of the person he could have been and isn't like his regrets and all of that kind of stuff comes up. And that's the only thing that the story is. And it's the best fucking story in that collection. Wow. And it's just a story about a guy thinking about the life he could have had and didn't Mm -hmm. on the set of this famous zombie movie when he and this woman that he runs into are both in like zombie makeup. Mm -hmm. I went read that and I immediately called Daniel and I was like, Daniel, have you read that story, that Joe Hill story in that collection? He's like, yeah. He's like, I think it's the best story in the whole book. I'm like, yeah. And it's the only one that no zombies show up in. Right. And from then on, like every time a collection came out, I was looking for his name Mm -hmm. and I was so happy I did because then his uh, collection, um, 20th century ghost came out, which I think is a fantastic story collection. And then when his first novel came out, Heart Shaped Box, I bought that as soon as I could get my hands on it. And from then on, I was like, all right, I does it like any anytime a novel comes out. So he went into the same category a few other writers on that. Doesn't matter what the title of the book is. All that matters is his name is at the top of the cover. I just buy it. Like, I don't yeah. even think about it. Yeah, that's well, the point I was making is that. You know, I'm a Stephen King fan. Every time he has a book that like that's an event for me. He has two books come out a year and I'm there and I get, you know, and I read it and I'm a big fan. But now I'm excited because, you know, King's getting up there, you know, and it's like, wow, this is like a tradition I've had. But now I got Joe Hill. I got like another I got like another lifetime of these great books coming out because I I like them. I like him as much as his father. And there are ways that I actually like him better than his father. Things he does that I actually like better than what his dad does in terms of structure or. That his endings, I think Joe out of the gate was better at sticking a landing than his dad was just right out of the gate. Like heart shaped box has a great ending and it's the first novel he ever wrote. So yeah. And you do his pop art in, in uh, 20th century ghosts. Yes. Yes. Yeah. That was, that was, inc- and that caught me by Cause you talk about something where there's no horror involved or anything like yeah. just this beautiful story about a, a boy and his imaginary friend. And that was a powerful story. So yeah. He wrote Black Phone, the movie we're talking about today. We, yes, he wrote don't, the novel. Don't get, Are, don't get us sidetracked on on Kingland. Yeah, it's actually it's not a novel. It's a it's short a, story. A, a short story and novella. I don't remember what link. A novella. Is. Yeah, yeah. I'll get it. I'll get it right the third time. It's a novella. <laughs> so this was directed by Scott Derrickson and Robert yep. Cargill. Do yep. you know Robert Cargill a little bit? Or I only. I mean, we only know each other through internet interactions. Yeah. Um. I mean, we're friendly. We're definitely friendly. When, when the movie came out and I saw it, I shot him a message and told him how much I enjoyed it and asked him for a copy of the, the script. So he, he would kindly sent me a copy of the script so I could read it. Yeah, I've, I've, I'm a big fan of the two of them working together. I, I think that as a team for making this kind of movie, I think they're a really great team. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. And Deckerson for me is kind of one of those guys that are, that are, that's out there you know, almost, you know, you're talking about Joe Hill when he has a book coming out, you're going to be there and everything like that. I'm getting to that place where if he has a movie coming out, I'm going to go watch it. It's, there's something interesting there. Yeah. You know, I like the type of filmmaker he is. I like what he's yeah. trying to do. I didn't love his early movies. The first couple of movies he made, I... I Sinister? No, no, way before Sinister. Oh, uh, okay. Sinister was the first movie he made with Cargill. Uh-huh. Um, no, but he made uh, two or three movies before that. But when Sinister came out, I don't know if he just had matured as a filmmaker or if he and Cargill working together brings out a next level of creativity in him or what it is. But I thought Sinister was very well made, very well directed. I think it's an interesting take Mm -hmm. on media and horror hiding in media. You know, there's a theme of horror in media that goes way back, clear back to when the only media was the written word that. You know, the idea of horror hiding in the written word is a very old idea. But this, you know, updating it to the day of, of film, you know, that, that something horrific can hide in film. And, and I just thought it was really well made. I thought it was really well done. So th- from that point on, I was like, oh, I'm going to keep an eye on these guys. I think they're really interesting together. So I, I hope they keep working together. What struck me about this movie, well, again, and how I came across this movie is I usually have to get a recommendation or a horror film or a certain, I have to get two or three recommendations before I go in just because it's like time is so limited and there's so many things to watch. 
And this is one where I kind of uh, just took a, I did have a friend mention it and said he liked it. And it was one of those things, you know, it, it, it all depends on the mood you're in when you do the viewing or whatever. And I sat back and I watched it. But for me, having two young boys and watching yeah. this and like having, you know, again, it's like uh, one of the things that Joe Hill talks about is the two different types of horror. There's the empathetic horror and the catharsis horror. And I know that you, you, you're going to comment on that at some point, but you know, I've always tried to pinpoint it, but I'm definitely lean more towards the empathetic horror. And yeah. this one, I mean, talk about caring about the characters because I have two boys yeah. and anything with kids, it immediately makes me completely vulnerable and connected to the characters and just terrified for them. Yeah. And yeah. so uh, those two actors, I think the, the boy's name is Mason Thames and the girl is Madeline McGraw. And, uh, and I thought they were fantastic. Yeah, I, I thought they were both really good. I, I especially liked her. I mean, I think he was very sympathetic. And I think, I think Finn, Finny was a, a very sympathetic character. And I wanted him to get out of there and I wanted him to survive and all that. So it was definitely like you're talking about the empathetic horror for sure. Yeah, before we go to her, though, the trap um, a lot of the time with kid actors and what he did very well was his restraint. Because yeah. he never pushed for emotion. He never showed his, he, he was always trying to control it. He was always trying to, and there was something subtle about his performance. And there's a maturity in that, that type of performance that you rarely see with kids. And it isn't until he has his last, you know, breakdown where he's trying to break into the freezer where he lets it all go. And so when an actor doesn't feel sorry for himself, you feel sorry for them. Yeah, and so exactly. and there was a reserve of strength and maturity and restraint in his performance that's very rare for young actors. I saw a thing one time where an actor was explaining how to pull emotion out of the audience, and they said, "If the actor cries, you give the audience permission not to cry. But when an actor's in a situation that would make a person cry, and you can see them fighting not to cry, then the audience cries." So yeah, it's exactly what we're talking about. Like if we can see. The emotion that we feel the character would be having and we can see them fighting not to show that there's something in our limbic system that gives us permission to feel it for them yeah the empathetic right you know we're talking about empathetic horror suddenly we feel this rush of empathetic emotion because we see them struggling not to feel that yeah it's 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 a much more powerful tool like anybody you know the they, they they'll blast air in your eyes anybody can cry on camera now they'll just mm -hmm. shoot air in your eyes and you'll cry yeah so that's, that's, I think, easy. What's not easy is to get on the verge of crying and then hold it back. And that's powerful. Because it's honest. It's what we do. Yeah. You know, the reason it is like that is because in, in life, we never want to show vulnerability. We never yeah. want to show. And so anybody who's overcome with emotion, the first thing they try to do is choke it back to control it, to not yep. show it, to hide. So when we see that, we see honesty. We see somebody that's not you know, performing for the envelope, thinking about they're performing, thinking about the Emmy Awards and what, and exactly. what they're going to wear that night or anything. No, they're just in the moment and they're moved by the emotion. And they're like, shit, I don't want to show this. And so it's, it's all these truth triggers where you watch and it's like, then you let go. If somebody's just throwing it out there, displaying it for everybody to see, it's, it's like when somebody's lying to you and they're manipulating you with emotion and they're showing yeah. you the emotion because they want to manipulate you with it. And then you immediately be like, fuck that person. You know, I mean, that's the same way you feel about actors trying to manipulate Lee. Look how, how good I can cry and how sad I am. And I'm going to show this to you. And it takes you out of the story. It's distracting. The first time I really saw a kid with the power to do that was um, when they were shooting the pilot. Uh, well, not the pilot, the first season of Game of Thrones. George and I went out to Malta where they were shooting a bunch of stuff. And there were some scenes that they were shooting with uh, Maisie Williams, who plays Arya. And she was a little kid at the time. I mean, that was, what, 10 years ago. So she was like maybe 11 or 12. But she's small for her age, so she seemed really young. And uh, there's a bunch of scenes that she was shooting where she's clearly terrified because her dad's just been killed and they're trying to smuggle her out of the city. and. Uh, you know, all this, all this terrifying stuff is happening. When you watched her, you could see that she was terrified and she was desperately trying to hide it and pretend like she wasn't scared and pretend like she was brave. And it was so fucking powerful. It's, it was so powerful. And I had never seen a young actor have that control over their talent before, that level of control over it. But I think we watch a movie like this and you're seeing young actors like that who actually have 
that control over their over the talent where they're you know where they're doing exactly what you're talking about they're in the moment they're feeling the emotion but they're also feeling the need to fight that emotion and hold tamp it down and so they the person watching them gets all of those layers in the performance mm mm-hmm. And then you were about to talk to, about the girl before I cut you off. Oh no, I just was going to say I, 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 I think they're both great actors. I just loved that character. So if you take a, like a eleven year old girl and make her an angry Spitfire, I am automatically a fan. Like I don't know why there's just if, something if about that archetype. Off. If they pull if they, it they, off, if they can pull it off, because they, they have to yeah. understand what that is yep. and what that means. And this yeah. girl is, I think she's even done. I think I think I remember reading like she was like a Disney actress, like did like some Disney shows and stuff like that. Mm. So she has this cuteness of this like Disney actress, but yeah. she is, you know, she's a lion. She's got the heart of a lion, and she's ferocious. <laughs> That's and. The point That's what I loved. that scene when they're beating up her brother yep. and then I see and I you immediately see her and you expect, oh, no, her little sister is going to come. It's going to. And she just like motherfuckers. And she picks up a rock <laughs> and then just yep. starts throwing down with those kids. And then the kid gets hit and they're sitting up against the fence and he has blood pouring down his face. It's, it's just it's great and then the interrogation scene that she's in she's like do you think i'm a fucking dummy you know I'm like they're going to this thing uh, you know like would i be fucking stupid enough to do it was just uh she was uh, fantastic it felt real because it didn't feel sanitized for television yeah like they allowed the adorable little disney girl to chuck a rock hard enough to crack some kid's head open right like that's not a thing you see but like but the moment it happened i was like i believe that would happen yeah I believe that a girl trying to save her brother from some bullies doesn't know what to do, grabs a rock and just hucks it. That feels like a thing that would happen, and right? And they w- didn't sanitize it. And I loved that. And what's great, usually if you're completely honest, and I know there's a lot of uh, both of uh, Derrickson and, and Cargill, I know there's a lot of their personal lives into this. And if you're dead honest, a lot of times things will be unexpected and refreshing, a yeah. fresh choice. Because how many times have we seen the little girl crying over her brother getting beaten up, but powerless to do something, right? Yeah. But then, yep. so when this girl runs up, you have the expectation of what's going to happen. And then she picks up a rock and just yokes this kid over the head. And then it's just <laughs> like fighting like, uh, like ferociously, you know, even back to the scene where the father's, uh, God, it was a rough scene where the father's spanking her because yeah. she's, she's having these visions and he's obviously terrified that she's going to go down the same path that her mother went down. Yeah. And he's like, say it again, say it again. But they said that that moment that she had now that you watch that and you talk about a powerful performance and, and such a young actress is she, she, you know, she's getting spanked. She's getting beaten by her father, but then something inside of her awakens like her, her strength, her survival, instinct her power her rage and she's like fucking just comes at him and you realize in that moment she's always she's a fighter and she's always going to fight yep and she's had she's got grit so when her brother is locked up but down in the the basement you're like don't count this little girl out she's going to figure it out she's going to get her brother it's interesting because joe and i actually had an email conversation a while back about he made a comment about how there's only two reactions that everybody has to their father in a preface to one of his stories. And I, I wrote him an email and said, I actually think there's a third thing. And we had a conversation about it. And it was, it was an interesting conversation. But one of the things that I believe is true about kids in an abusive situation, and the other thing that this movie doesn't shy away from, is that people can do terrible things out of love. The dad thinks he's saving her. He's terrified that she's going to die like her mother did. And he's trying to save her from that. And he is doing awful, awful things in what he would argue is from a position of love. And I like that the movie doesn't shy away from that, that the story yeah. doesn't shy away from that because that is the case. People do terrible things out of love. But my feeling is if you come up in a house like this, that there's one of two ways you go. You're either broken by it and you spend the rest of your life allowing people to beat you up or you're empowered by it and you spend the rest of your life fighting back. And, you know, like in my house, like I've been a fighter all my life. My, my sister, uh, you know, she died a while back, but she spent her whole life not fighting. So like even within the same house, two very different reactions to the same sort of uh, upbringing with this girl, 
you like you said, she's going to be a fighter her whole life. You watch that, and you're like, oh, okay, this this is the reaction this girl's having. She's like, she's like, oh, I don't like being beat up like this. I don't like being abused like this. And I'm never going to let people do this to me ever mm-hmm. again. Yeah, and you can just see the decision in her face. Decision like, no, right there. Like, you do not want to be the boyfriend that decides to smack that girl around. You are getting wrecked. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> like she is not going to put up with that shit yeah. for two seconds. Yeah. She's yeah. going to pick up that fucking rock that she broke that other kid's head with, and she's going to crack yep. your skull. And that's yep. another that's another uh, example of of really great writing is the father. You know, you're talking about him being motivated from love, whereas yeah. the mistake that the writer or the actor would in that scene is that there's just this evil alcoholic that just you know yeah. torments his kids and and but the fact that he loved his kids. Yeah. That made it so much more powerful, so much more tragic. Well, he's not a caricature. And when, when he has to tell his son that his, his friend has gone missing, you see how much that weighs on him. You know, you see that he doesn't yeah. want to hurt his son. And that's, that is way more effective and way more powerful. And one of the things that I, I like r- right away that I really connected to was like the 70s nostalgia. Now, I'm a nostalgia guy, and I love, you know, all things nostalgia. I love all things that have happened already. But this was different. This was, first of all, it was really well done. I mean, this is, it was very lived in, uh, but it was more raw. It was, it was gritty. It wasn't like Stranger Things, right? Like you, it's, the whole thing is, the whole fuel that runs that engine is 80s nostalgia. But it's like yeah. the, 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 the airbrushed 80s, right? The airbrushed 80s nostalgia. This was like the gritty life of a kid in America in seventies. And this is what like the childhoods that we remembered, right? Like I yeah. remember, you know, you, the violence that these, that, that as kids that you experienced in those days was fucking brutal. The scene in there where they were having that fight and all the kids were standing around, they're like, get out, get out. And they're foaming out of the mouth. And they're like, like that's those, that's the shit that I remember. Right. Yeah. And they did such yeah. a good job of telling that story of of that kind of gritty, real violence that we all experienced growing up and we just don't see anymore. In my junior high and high school, almost every day you'd hear somewhere in the school grad, you'd hear fight, fight, fight. And everybody would go running over there to see what was going on. Yeah. Yeah. Happened. Happened almost every day. You know, and it was like a it was like a form of status, right? It's kind of like how you get your status if you're a tough kid in school. But they, I thought they did a really great job with that that whole that whole thing. Did you like the the nostalgia of it all? I mean, it felt it felt very real for sure. Um, and I think it's a story that needs to take place in that time period in order order for the story to make sense. So yeah, I I I I like that. I don't. I'm not as in love with as nostalgia for the sake of nostalgia as you are. Yeah. But I think when a story requires it then it has a place. Like I think Stranger Things only makes sense in that sort of early to mid 80s setting. I think it has to take place there. And and but just to be fair, I'm not nostalgia for now just nostalgia's sake. I mean, I I see it done poorly a lot, but when it's done yeah. well and it's the, and the story requires it, then I'm on board and I'm a yeah. huge fan. Yeah. So and I think this story needed to take place in the time period it takes place in. I will say for those not familiar, uh spoilers, the story is about a kid in a town where multiple kids have gone missing and they're not sure who's doing it and that he gets he gets grabbed up by the guy who's been kidnapping these kids and he discovers that the kids are taken to this basement they're held down there for some indeterminate amount of time and then killed and discovers that the ghosts of the kids who have been killed are still sort of haunting this basement and they can talk to him through this old black phone that's hanging on the wall, this old black like rotary style phone. And that's where the, the movie gets its title, Black Phone. It's sort of a kidnapped story, but it's also a ghost story. So it's kind of a, a weird mix of those things. And it and becomes a sort killer of a story and be a serial killer story. And then it becomes kind of a team story because the kids who have, who have previously been killed team up as ghosts. I, I don't, it sounds cheesy when I say it that way, but, but it's not cheesy in the movie. They, they, they work to try to save this kid, uh, to try to help this kid get away. And so it, it becomes very sort of, there's this wonderful catharsis when, you know, when the, the kid is able to survive, that it feels like he's sort of winning one for all the kids who didn't make it. You know, that, that, that they are all sort of part of that, that win. Yeah, it's, it's just really well structured and really well laid out. But I think 
talking about the time period, that old phone on the wall felt very sort of like late seventies, early eighties. So I just felt right in that. And also this idea that the way that ubiquitous cell phones have changed society has made a lot of stories difficult to do now. There are a lot of stories that just kind of don't work anymore now that everybody has a cell phone and everybody can talk to everybody at any moment. And so for a story like this, where it is about being locked away and not being able to communicate with the outside and, you know, like his sister looking for him and not being able to find him, I think that that claustrophobia does work better in a pre cell phone setting. So I, I, I think it also, that part of it also works better in the time period that it's taking place in. So for me, not only is it a ghost story, which is another one of my strike zone favorites, it's a, uh, a serial killer, but it does, it also turns into a prison escape movie Yeah, <laughs> when he's caught in the basement. And, uh, and this, I thought this was a lot of fun because all of these kids were kept down there and they all tried to escape. And they yep. had very painful lessons that they played, paid for in blood. And yep. so it's collectively these kids combining their knowledge yep. uh, to help out this kid. And they, they do a good job explaining, you know, the mother obviously has this gift. The daughter yep. has the gift. And now you see that the son has the gift. And, and he can hear this phone. And the other kids couldn't hear the phone. So he could hear yep. this phone. And the kids are all people from his life. Most, for the most part, are all people from his life that he had interactions with or experienced with. And so it, the movie's really well done in the way that his interaction, and they didn't have a lot of time. They had like, what, 25 minutes to really set that up. But his interactions with the kids pay off later. Yeah. But each attempt to escape or each knowledge that he picks up through these kids, they all ultimately in the end pay off. It's yeah. not like these cheap episodics where he almost goes escape and then it comes back and then they forget about that and he escape. No, everything at the end is used in a very neat and interesting way, in a fun way. And one of the things that they establish is that his probably closest friend at the school he goes to, who's sort of been his protector uh, from the bullies, is one of the kids who is kidnapped and later finds out has been killed. So it gives him a really personal connection. Because like he kind of knew the other kids, like one of them was like a paper boy that he knew. And so like he kind of knew the other kids, but one of the kids is probably his best friend. And so there's this deeply personal connection to that story as well, which is great because it really that that sucks you into that part of what this kid is trying to do is he's he's trying to get away. He's trying to survive, but he's also kind of awake, trying to avenge his best friend. Mm hmm. Who died, you know? Yeah. And he has like, you know, in the beginning, you, you know, you can, his dad is this abusive alcoholic and he has a little bit of that freeze, that trauma freeze when, when he was getting beat up by those kids. Yeah. And his friend has this strength that he admires and he, and he, in that he admires in his friend and he's his protector. Well, this whole transition, this whole period is letting him know you have that same fight inside of you. You can protect yourself. You can avenge me as opposed to me protecting you. Yeah. And this whole process of being down in that dungeon awakens this strength and this reserve within him. And it was really well done. And I love, I love the ending, seeing him, you know, at the end of like walking through school and his new experience being this new person of what he's, what he's learned about himself and the strength. And, uh, you know, I really, we, you know, we haven't talked about the grabber much. The, the yeah. villain in well, this. Well, we should talk about the grabber because yeah. uh, brilliantly portrayed by one of my favorite actors working right now, Ethan Hawke. He's probably your number two favorite, right? Just behind me. Go ahead. Sorry. Oh, you're an actor? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I, I, I've, I, I've always really liked Ethan Hawke. I think he's only gotten more interesting as he gets older. Because, you know, for a long time, he mostly played the pretty boy because he's very pretty. And so he would get the pretty boy parts. Uh, as he has aged, he has gotten much more interesting parts. And really, it, it's allowed him to shine as a performer because he can do a lot, of, a lot more than people were giving him credit for 10 years ago or 15 years ago. There's a lot more substance to him as a performer. And uh, I, I think he's great in this. I think he's, he's chewing the scenery the exact right amount mm -hmm. as the psycho serial killer. He's terrifying and dramatic but he's never over the top mm -hmm. you never roll your eyes mm -hmm. and and at the same time there's something almost the, the way it's played he's he's kind of a tragic character too yeah 
Yeah. That's the skill of, of Ethan Hawke and what he does is yeah. because within this performance where he's wearing the mask and in, in something that I did, I'm wearing a mask within the thing a lot of the times. And so I un, like there's something really interesting and freeing and there's something different that comes out in you when you have this presence and you know what this presence is. And those masks were fantastic. They were yeah. developed by Tom Savini, I think it is. So everything is everything is full circle. With this show is only about full circle things. Tom Savini hung out with Joe Hill when Joe Hill was a little kid. Oh, that's right. Yeah, on when Joe Creep Hill show. was a little kid, his his dad was working on um, uh, Creep Show, and he was hanging out with his dad on the set of Creep Show. And Tom Savini kind of took him under his wing, took him back in the uh, in the special effects and models shop and makeup shop and would have, have Joe help him with stuff. Joe was back there putting, putting makeup on models and stuff like that. And uh, yeah, so he's, he's got a, he's got a, this long history with Tom Savini, which I'm super jealous of. Cause that would be awesome. If you're a kid, my favorite short story in full throttle is the one where Joe Hill talks about reading, uh, bring on the bad guys with his father. Yeah. And he's in his father's reading these stories. And he's like, you know, if you ask me what they sound like, I'd say it sound like my dad. But you hear yep. that and you're like, that's fucking Stephen King reading yes. these ghost Stephen stories. King is reading night. stories to you. Yeah, yeah it's insane. Um, but he's well, he, it, he, that makes me think of your story about being in the acting class with uh, oh, Scott uh, Eastwood. Clint Eastwood. Yeah, Scott yeah. Eastwood. That's and, exactly. And the, and the the teacher's like, okay, now imagine your father, and you were sitting there going, this motherfucker's imagining Clint Eastwood. <laughs> yeah. I just pictured like we're laying there and we have you know when you're in acting class you're doing all kinds of crazy stuff. But we had, you know, our, my eyes were closed and the room was completely dark. And I just imagine like everybody's a hologram of everybody's father's bust, like over their, you know, over their thing, just kind of. And then you just look over and it's Clint Eastwood, like with this thing going on there. <laughs> um, but anyway, you know, one of the things that I liked about this villain, the grabber, is there's a lot of mystery to him. They didn't like over explain or anything like that. And based off Ethan Hawke's performance, there is a bit of sympathy that you have for him because there's yeah. echoes of something of him being locked in this room. Yes. And there's something really interesting about the masks where it's almost like he has a shame about what he's doing and he can only do it if he's wearing the masks. Yeah. So he doesn't, so he has a little bit of not wanting to do this thing. And th there's a, there's a lot of lure in how they talk about him. But the thing that's terrifying to me is he can't just kill them. Right. There's some kind of ritual that he has to go through. Yeah. He has to break them down and they have to become naughty boys or whatever. And so he like he leaves the door open and leaves that. And so the fact that the kid is not taking the bait, then Ethan Hawk, the grabber, can't exercise whatever it is he's trying to exercise. You know, he can't he can't allow that thing to happen. Perversely, he needs them to deserve their death. Which, of course, no little kid deserves to be killed no matter what they do. There's this weird, like you said, a ritual where he's He's creating a situation in which they will break the rules, which then makes them naughty boys, which then gives him permission to kill them. And just that series of that chain of logic that he's going through there tells you horrible things about his own childhood. His childhood broke his brain to create that chain of logic. And you just you imagine what that was like and it's just horrifying. I think to me, the most horrifying visual the whole time is when he leaves the door unlocked. You think he's about to go. He gets a call on the phone and the kid says, don't go. This is, he's, you, he's tricking you. And the yeah. camera slowly goes up the stairs and then he's sitting yeah. in the, in the kitchen with his shirt off and his mask with the belt yep. in his hand. That's, that was a great visual. It, it really was. It was, it was actually maybe one of the best shots in the movie. And like you said, it was terrifying and nothing happens. It's just, it's all about stillness but it is a terrifying stillness. And uh, yeah, that's, that's good filmmaking. Yeah. And I think, you know, I think this is a horror film, but it's definitely towards the thriller end of the spectrum. And like, and I, I love a good suspense mystery and thriller. And that was terrifying. And, you know, I think uh, I like the way all the kids come together at the end when the little girl is riding her bike and they're there yeah. and then they show them. There's something really beautiful about, all these kids growing up in the seventies and, and taking the, taking the, the chips to their psyche that the seventies growing up in the seventies. And at that time, what it does, like they're emotionally taking the beating of, uh, the violence and the, the alcoholic fathers and the, 
And they all kind of come together, all wounded as they are, come together and they help out the one, the one other kid that's still living and they point out to where he is, which I thought was really beautiful. It's very, it's a very satisfying conclusion to that story that, uh, you know, you, you're hoping for a, a happy, positive, optimistic outcome of that terrifying situation. And the movie delivers it and manages to walk the tightrope of not making it sappy. You know, it wasn't like the saccharine sweet ending. It's still, a, it's still tragedy and horror. But it's it, you get to the end and you feel that like that satisfaction, uh, you know, at the ending. It had that Silence of the Lambs switch too, where they were going, they went into the wrong house. You know, I enjoyed that. What did you think of the brother? That, I thought it was an interesting idea, but I, I feel like that is the one part of the movie of the story that isn't adequately explored. Like, like it hints at an interesting story and then never quite engages with it. Mm-hmm. So I, I, that if, if there was any criticism of this movie that I had, it was either, either get rid of the brother or expand him. Because mm-hmm. I feel like the version they have in the film is, is underbaked. Yeah. I can understand the argument of expand him. Yeah. But I thought that it was a shot at something that was different. We've seen the guy alone in the house, right? We've seen those guys over and over for him to have a brother that is in his house in real time and for him to come down and give food only at certain times because there's somebody else in the house and the kid figures yeah. that out yeah. to me that was that there's something spookier about that that he can't operate at all times and it gives the kid a little bit of some leverage yeah it gives you a window yeah, yeah. it gives you a window of of what's happening what's in there and the fact that there was somebody in there and then you're like wait a minute there's people up there that like a normal family, they have no idea that there's a kid trapped in the basement. And I thought that was really interesting. And then well, there was a, and I, and the comic relief worked on me too, when he, when they come in and he's all coked up and then, yeah. and, then, and, then, and then at the end when he finds the kid and he's like, Hey, you want me to tell you how I figured it out? <laughs> and then yeah, and, I, 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 I do. I felt like it was a little undercooked. Um, uh-huh. and, but I, like, it's, it's a fantastic movie and I, I I'm, looking for a criticism at this point yeah. you know uh because when i watched it I, I i definitely it didn't bother me that much but let me tell you so there's a show on hulu i think it's an fx show but i've been uh-huh. watching it on hulu called the patient have mm-hmm. you heard of that i have i haven't okay. seen it but i keep hearing great things about it okay ahead. yeah well, i think steve you told Carell, me about it yeah yeah it's it's steve carell there's a similar story point in the patient and i won't talk a lot about the patient or give any too much away but it's a similar situation where he is kidnapped by a serial killer and he's being held by a serial killer and realizes that there is somebody else in the house upstairs mm. and it turns out that it's the serial killer's mother and i feel like the patient knows what to do with that subplot like the things that they're doing with that subplot are are very interesting mm. so i feel like i think after having watched black phone and then watching the patient, I think probably in retrospect, I'm like, oh, wow, the patient did this right. I wish Black Phone had just cooked that story just a little bit more because what, what the patient is doing with that same sort of subplot is fucking brilliant. Uh, and, and by the way, if you like psychological horror, uh, all eight of you who are listening to this, watch the patient. It is tense and terrifying and profound and steve carell's a genius yeah yeah i'm not sure we got the full eight on this session um because we're not talking about the expanse but you know <laughs> okay well, so the five of you who listen when we, <laughs> we got we got a healthy expanse. five i think we got yeah. a healthy yeah. of our die yeah. hard watch, that watch is, the that patient or die for us watch the patient but there's something interesting of like oh wait this guy had a brother you know and then yeah. when he kills his brother and he's like you made me kill my brother so he actually kind of cared about something i you know i thought i i like that i like the of it now I really enjoy your encyclopedic knowledge of <laughs> horror movies. And, uh, and I know this is kind of putting you on the spot a little bit, and, and, but not, it doesn't have to be like the definitive top five. But if we look at Joe Hill's kind of breakdown, and I know that you have some comments on that, but if we look, like, we look at Joe Hill's breakdown, we have the empathetic horror and cathartic horror. Well, what's the difference between them? For me, and my understanding of what Joe Hill was trying to say and, and about this, the difference between empathetic horror is... It's all about that horror is about empathy 
And it's all about how much you care about the people. And if you truly care about them, when something bad happens to them, then you're going to go on that emotional ride. You're going to be a part of that. You're going to be connected to it. And it's exploring that empathy between something happening to another person. A cathartic yeah. horror movie is about characters that you don't like, that you don't care about, and they die spectacularly. And you enjoy yeah. the kills and, and the way that they're murdered. Yeah. And so my, my question to you is because I lean towards the empathetic side, I really like, I thoroughly enjoyed Black Phone, the book, yeah. it, um, and the movie, it, um, the, the old one and the new one, um, big fans of. Is there other cousins to this movie, the empathetic horror, that you would recommend off the top of your head? To the, to the five listeners that are listening, I think that division is overly simplistic. But but I, I do it, too. It's at least I, I, it's I agree at least with that a, too. It's a good starting point for a conversation, though. Yeah, because I do think Joe is describing something real, which is that some horror movies are about making you care about the characters, and some horror movies don't give a shit if you care about the characters. And I think that's why you and I, neither of us, really engage with uh the standard slasher film that much yeah like i don't care at all about friday the 13th no you know where it's like a bunch of knucklehead kids go up to a cabin have sex smoke pot and get murdered by jason who cares like i never have cared about those movies but it's that cathartic you're talking about it's like you know these knuckleheads are getting murdered haha it's funny to watch them get killed i'm i'm with you i'm on your side on this i'm much more into the empathetic where like give me a character to care about and then you can put them through the ringer and maybe they make it and maybe they don't. But the emotional journey you take me on is hope for them, you know, happiness at their triumphs, sadness and fear at their, at their, you know, suffering, all of that. And some movies kind of can give you both. Like mm-hmm. uh, I recently watched the, the Hulu update of Hellraiser. I don't know if you've seen that yet. No, I, I'm, I was um, so curious to hear what you thought of that. Which, which kind of does both. So, so I'll, I'll talk about the original Hellraiser so that we're not spoiling the new one. Because I would like to talk about... One thing you and I should do is a viewing of the original Hellraiser and the new Hellraiser. And do like a two-parter. Mm-hmm. Because I think that would be really interesting to do. But yeah. Th- talking about the original Hellraiser. Have, you've seen the original Hellraiser, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Okay. So it, it, that's a movie that kind of gives us both. So... Christie's uncle and her mother are horrible, horrible people. And we cannot wait to watch the Cenobites rip them to shreds, right? Mm-hmm. But Christie herself is not a terrible person. She's actually a nice person. She's actually trying to do good things. So we want to see her escape from Pinhead's grasp. We want to see her find a way to not be torn apart by the Cenobites. And so it kind of gives us both of those things. And I think... A lot of my favorite movies walk that line because one of the movies I was going to talk about um, that kind of has that empathetic thing is is a little indie film called Your Next about a girl who gets invited to dinner with her boyfriend's parents and and siblings in this house in the country. And while she's there, masked killers start show up and start murdering them. And so what you wind up with is that that combination of both because some of some of her boyfriend's siblings are terrible people. The masked killers are obviously terrible people. And the girl is nice. She's like a really nice person. Like she's very like you want to see her survive. You want to see her win. So you get both where it's like we want to see her survive. We're very empathetic to her as a character. And at the same time, I want to watch her fuck up those masked guys and the, the evil siblings because in the plot of that movie, a small spoiler here, it turns out that she grew up in an Australian survivalist compound when she was a kid and has a wide variety of survival skills. So when these mass killers show up to, to murder them, she immediately goes full Rambo and like starts like taking them out. And so you get both, you get sympathy for her and catharsis when she fucks up these dudes in the mass. Um, I love movies like this. So your next is one of those movies. Joseph and I were talking about this earlier, uh, a Samara weaving movie um, ready or not where she plays a woman who's recently married into this large family. And when she gets to the dinner with the big family, she re- she discovers that they have some kind of satanic pact where they are randomly decided of a person who's joined the family has to be sacrificed. 
And she gets there and they do the thing and they decide she has to be sacrificed. And she's like, no, fuck that. I'm not going to be sacrificed and spends the rest of the movie getting away from them and fucking them up. But again, it's that it's that combination, right? It's like, uh, like, I like Samara Weaving. I want her to win. Like, she's cool. And at the same time, these people who want to sacrifice you for marrying their son, fuck them. They need to go. Right. <laughs> I, I feel like that whenever, it, whenever you if you invite me over to dinner, at your house yeah. in Washington, I always feel like I always feel like I'm going to walk in and you and Daniel will be there and I'll sit. Down. Daniel doesn't live at my house. <laughs> so but that's what I'm saying. He'll be there, <laughs> yeah. though. And I'll sit okay. down and it's like, listen, we made a deal with the devil. Why do you think the expanse got off the ground and everything like that? <laughs> and we have to sacrifice one of our friends, we have to like the person to sacrifice. So that's the oh, point yeah. of it, you know? So yeah. sorry, dude, but you're, you're going <laughs> you down and I'm, and I'm like, what? And it's like, whoosh, all of a sudden I'm like, oh, and I realize I'm handcuffed to the chair and I'm like, <laughs> fucking time. What are you talking about? I know, dude, I know. <laughs> but <laughs> Joseph has suggested get out. I, I think get out is a good example of that. Um, I, I think that's a good, good recommendation uh, because we really like the main character. He seems like a really good guy. And and after he goes to that creepy picnic or whatever it is, where everybody's being like subtly racist to him the whole time, we're very sympathetic to him. Like it, we feel like he's being treated like shit. We don't want him to be treated like shit. He seems like a good guy. And then when they turn on him and he discovers what they're about to do to him, one, I want him to get away. I want him to win. And two, I want him to fuck those people up. Like, I just, I like, it's both, it's both empathetic and cathartic when he's getting away. At the scene where he takes out the brother who thinks he's like some jujitsu badass or something. Oh, yeah. And, and he, he, he finds a way to get out of the being grappled by him and just wrecks him. I, I was, I was, I practically cheered when that scene happened. So I, I think I think Get Out is a good example. And then the other one that Joseph threw up here, which I actually think is is a pretty good one, is Doctor Sleep. You and I both loved Doctor Sleep. It didn't we get as much together. attention as Yeah, we did. It didn't get as much attention as either of us thought it should have. It's a I think it's a really worthy follow up to both the book of The Shining and the movie of The Shining, which is amazing that they were able to pull that off, that it's a worthy follow up to both. But again, it is you feel bad for Danny. Danny had a fucked up life yeah. when he was like a kid and, and he was grew up, he was growing up in a hotel filled with ghosts and his dad went crazy and tried to murder him and his mother. Like that's fucked up. And you're going to come out of that with some trauma. We feel sorry for Danny. We feel a great deal of empathy for Danny. So when the, when the vampires start coming after him, when the psychic vampires start coming after him, you want him to win. So yeah, I think that's definitely a good example of the empathetic. Uh, Dr. Sleep was very well done. And I, and yeah. I agree with that. I think it honored both versions, which is like threading a needle that's not many people can do. And the filmmaker yeah. that did that, he's also, he, he's kind of like a, a Scott Derrickson for me too, like a an interesting guy yeah. that's coming up, that's doing these really interesting work. I agree. Um, and uh, and he's another guy that I'm looking out for and going to go see anything he does. I, I agree. I, I think he's a really interesting filmmaker and I can't wait to see him do more stuff. But doc, yeah, so Dr. Sleep is a good one for that. Also, the little girl that they start hunting is very sympathetic in Dr. Sleep. So when Danny and the little girl get together and are trying to evade, you know, try, working to try to evade these very powerful psychic vampires, like you want them to win. You're, you're really pulling for both of them. That one, I'm, that one I'm conflicted on, though, because while I do want Danny and the, and the girl to get away and survive, I also want Rose the Hat to get whatever she wants. So, so, so I, I'm very conflicted on that because I'm like, I'm like, don't kill Rose the Hat. She's awesome. I, I don't want her to die. <laughs> I'm a big, big fan of Rose the Hat. If, yep. if Rose the Hat showed up in Caravan, I might be joining up. Yeah. So. Thank you guys for hanging out. I should have told you this at the beginning, but I think Joseph's putting something together at some point where we say like and subscribe and all the things. But please like and subscribe and support us and support su- su- Suspiria. Su- support su- support us. Support us. Suspiria. Is there is that a song? Suspiria. Su- su- no, it's Susudio. No, no, no. It's Suspiria. You don't know is what it? you're talking about. You, you think you know Phil Collins, dude? <laughs> I Phil Collins. Like, I know. Suspiria. Um, thank you for hanging out. Love you guys. And uh, please support us.
fucking support. I keep saying support us. Yes. <laughs> don't report us. Please don't. Don't report but, us. <laughs> please, please report Wes to the FBI for not being able to say any words. Yeah, exactly. He's, he's yeah. clearly just on drugs all the time. Please support us. Susperia. And by, and by us, when we say us, like you and I are doing this basically for free just to hang out. But please support Joseph. He has a family. No, if, when I say support us, I just mean like the like and the subscribe. And the, yeah. And I don't I even got, know I why understand. we need, I don't know why we need that. But Joseph told us that we need it. And so yeah. we have to do that. Yeah. Well, Joseph, Joseph is counting on us so that his, his kids don't have to like be sold for parts. No more shoe eating. Yeah. We, they don't have to eat shoes anymore. Say goodbye, Ty. Goodbye, Ty.